Congressman Randy Nagerbauer is on the line, District 19. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Where in the world are you? I am in Washington, D.C. this morning. Uh, we had a kind of a busy week as working on transportation bill, and uh, so I'm in uh, the nation's capital. All right. Uh, <clears throat> we'll get to the transportation bill and the budget here in a couple of minutes, but what are your uh, what are your thoughts about this last GOP debate and the questioning now, Laura DVR'd it, and, you know, she finally said that she came and she watched it and everything. She was thinking, oh, it wasn't so bad. I was like, I was I was thinking it was horrible. Well, I think the, the disappointing thing was this was supposed to be a debate where these uh, candidates laid out their vision for growing the economy. Just that day, we learned that the economy was growing at a very muted rate of 1.5%. And so it was an opportunity to hear... Uh, you know, what their vision of uh, and their, their plans were to do that. And uh, basically, I, I thought the CNBC started the, the, the whole process off trying to start a, a barroom brawl. And uh, so I think the big loser there is, you know, the American people uh, didn't get to hear as much about, you know, their these, their, these uh, candidates' vision to grow the economy. I'm just kind of curious because, <clears throat> you know, Ryan Spreebus, the – the national committee chair was basically going off on them over the weekend, but then they, you know, they had this, you know, impromptu meeting, and a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the campaigns are kind of going around the party and going into individual negotiations with the networks. So I guess the party would designate where the debates are going to be, but. You know, is this is this like kind of a uncharted, dangerous territory? You know, when when you have people, you know, that are that are stepping away from the party and, and going on their own negotiating. Yeah, I think the candidates need to be out campaigning and let the the party, you know, work that out. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, we the party tried to do this year uh, is to kind of take more control of the debates. We had way too many debates last time; uh, they weren't very well structured. And so they've been trying to bring some fairness and equity uh, to this process by agreeing to some ground rules uh, for these various debates. And I think what you heard what Mr. Prevost say is that, you know, CNBC didn't follow the ground rules uh, and that moving forward that we have to have more structure. I, I saw one of the issues is making sure that each candidate has equal time. Uh, so you've got ten candidates up there that all prepared for uh, that debate. Uh, and if, you know, three or four of them, you know, consume uh, a majority of the time, is that fair to, to the other candidates? But it's, it's a real tough issue, uh, Tom and Laura, as you can imagine, trying to organize a 10-person debate. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> in a two-hour two period uh, and making sure that everybody gets treated fairly. Right. Well, and then some people are also saying that the undercard people should also be included in the debate, so it could be more than 10. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. It is. I mean, who would have thought we would have had this, this many candidates? It, on one hand, it's a really good thing that the, the Republicans have a deep enough bench to, to uh, you know, put on the market this many candidates, but then the other uh, the issue is for the American people to begin to, you know, to whittle uh, this uh, list down, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's a difficult process. You know, when I ran for Congress the first time, there were 17 of us uh, in the race. And, and, and we all, you know, when we had forums, we were all 17 uh, were there, but you didn't get much time. Well, <clears throat> the interesting thing is the time that has been expended toward the candidate seems to be, it, it started out to be commensurate with the poll numbers. In other words, yeah. if you were hiring the polls, then you automatically got more time. And but but even still, in this last debate, it seemed like that started out that way, but then it seemed like the people that were willing to, you know, maybe take a step toward the argument or the argumentative stance would get a little bit more time, and then all of a sudden, everybody kind of pulled back and started gagging up on on the on the moderators. So you don't want the, the candidate. You want the candidates focusing on the issues and not trying to be be entertaining enough to get into the next debate. And I think that's that's what I think the point uh, that, that you're making. I think at some point in time, this is kind of a 
a, a more cruel aspect of it. But I think at some point in time, you have to start, you know, shrinking the number of people. I mean, should the one and two and three percenters, uh, you know, be on there with with the double digit people? And, and so, at some point in time, maybe the the, the early debate gets larger and uh, the later debate, you know, gets smaller. Yeah, uh, that's an idea. Hey, we'll be back talking budget and Paul Ryan. Good morning. This is Lubbock's First News. Uh, Tom Collins, Laura Mack, and Randy Nogmeyer on the line. Got a question or comment? Ring us up, 770-5790. Okay, Randy, uh, Paul Ryan is in and uh, seemed, to be kind of a, seemed to be kind of a love fest. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, the way he kind of comes in, even Nancy Pelosi was kind to him. Well, you know, Paul has uh, is really no more for a policy uh, wonk than he is, for, you know, being a political animal. And uh, so I think he has respect on both sides of the aisle. People think he's intelligent. The people think he's articulate. Uh, and uh, when when he talks about issues, he's he's, he's very knowledgeable. So uh, I think those are those are good uh, attributes uh, for a speaker. And I think there's a lot of anticipation that uh, you know that Paul can kind of get the troops rallied uh, back together and uh, that we can you know, move forward and, and do the people's work. Okay, i got a question for you. You know, when, when he comes into this, he says, I'm not going to do it unless I have support. Okay, and, and you know, up to the point, you know, I, I think that he's kind of, you know, walking along the, the line that, that he laid out there. He kind of drew the line in the sand. He says, if I'm going to do this, this is the way it's going to be. Now, yeah, should, you know, I think... Go ahead. Should these groups actually turn and start giving you know start giving them noise and static, and not really supporting and being uncooperative? Do you think he's just going to say, you know what, I told you guys, see you later, bye? Yeah, well, I think I think he laid out you know his his vision and how we move forward. I mean, what he said is, look, let's wipe this slate clean. Whatever that happened in the past is the past, and let's move forward. Let's move forward in a different way, though. Let's be more inclusive. Let's let the uh, legislation be driven at the committee level, the member level, and not at the leadership level. Uh, and so I think what these various groups need to do is, is listen uh, to what Paul is saying and also give him a chance, you know, to move some uh, legislation uh, through this process. This is something that won't be fixed overnight. It didn't get here overnight. Uh, but I think uh, what these groups need, and I think it was, it was good. Uh, he, uh, the, uh, he got 236 uh, of the 247 uh, uh, Republican votes, uh, and uh, I think that that was a that was a major stepping uh, stone. I think uh, in um, you know beginning his speakership. Well, that's kind of the way I think the founding fathers meant it to be, because rather than top down, it's supposed to be leeching from the bottom up, where people actually represent their constituents, and and you know, but but see that process like reversing the flow. I mean, that remains to be seen. Uh, relatively speaking, you know, Boehner's out, Ryan's in, budget passes. Laura has some questions for you on the budget. Yeah, it's, sure. with the budget, of course, a lot of concern out here involving federal crop insurance. Where does all of that stand now? Yeah, Laura, that's a very good question, and many of us were very concerned about it, very disappointed that that was in this this uh, budget deal. And so uh, we, uh, Mr. Conaway and Mr. Peterson and others on the Ag Committee, uh, including myself, expressed that, uh, you know, our displeasure with that because we just negotiated a five-year farm bill, been through this, uh, and so the leadership listened, uh, and what they're telling us is that in the uh, next appropriation bill, uh, that they're going to fix this. But unfortunately, this uh, reduction in crop insurance was in this budget agreement uh, that was voted on last week with the promise that, uh, you know, uh, things would, would change. Um, but while I couldn't vote for it for a number of reasons, one, because that provision is in there, but the other thing is is it increases the, the deficit uh, both this year and next year. Uh, it's spending now and paying for it uh, in later, uh, all the way out to 2025, and that's how we got an 18 trillion dollar uh, deficit. And that's how your new grandbaby uh, owes 56 thousand uh, dollars before they even, you know, get their first paycheck. And so we just got to stop doing business that way. That's if they were paying today. So are the farmers? I mean, still in danger of losing federal crop insurance? 
Well, if we don't get this provision out, uh, it would uh, be uh, a reduction in it. And, and, imp- and what we begin to con- get concerned about is it begins to shrink the uh, uh, margins that these crop insurance companies work off of. And in the last few years, they've taken a lot of hits. We've had a lot of drought years. And we've seen the consolidation in that industry and some people getting out of the crop insurance business. And when you get people out of the crop insurance business, then the concern is, is will the pricing be competitive? But more importantly, will there be companies out there offering crop insurance? And one of the things we did in the last farm bill is we moved a lot of the safety net for producers, particularly in cotton, uh, to uh, the uh, crop insurance program, and then if you begin to uh, chip away at that, that really leaves uh, area producers, you know, uh, out in the cold, and we just can't let that happen. We're in conversation with Congressman Randy Nagabar, Lubbock's First News. So you guys are working on a transportation bill, Randy. Uh, you know, and a lot of this has to do with, you know, fuel and harvest and things like that. Is this just like too much government? Well, it is. And, you know, one of the things, I have an amendment that basically allows uh, the people with a commercial driver's license uh, during harvest period to, you know, carry more than 118 gallons of fuel because many of the, the machines that they're, they're operating carry 500 or 1,000 gallons of fuel. It does make sense for the, you know, having to ferry 118 gallons of diesel back and forth. So it's just, like you said, it's just common sense. But uh, right now you're required, if you're going to carry that much fuel, you have to have, have a hazmat. Uh, certificate uh, to be able to do that. So what we really ought to be doing is letting the states, you know, regulate these kinds of activities rather than the federal government. Yeah, I I think that's a good idea. Kind of juxtaposing this with, you know, helping my mom make 16 dozen cookies last night. You know, I was Speaking of hazmat, (laughs) it appears Paul Ryan is having trouble getting rid of the cigarette smoke out of Boehner's former office. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, we're, we're, that, that'll be some, be some things about Mr. Boehner that some folks won't miss. And, uh, you know, uh, his uh, smoking <laughs> uh, habit uh, uh, was a little bit of an issue for some Yeah, somebody. apparently so. Having a hard time getting that smell out of there. Oh, yeah, well, here's good the luck thing. to him. We need to, a big job. We need to give him a gift certificate to the cleaning house at 34th and Indiana. There you go. They, they, they can got do a it. Exactly. They can, <laughs> they, can, they can get that smell out. All right, man. Have a great day. Thank you. Y'all have one. Appreciate it.